Section 1 You will hear a man who has just retired telephoning a part-time society to ask about membership and activities. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You will see there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello, this is the Leighton Society. How can I help? Oh, hello. I'm just phoning you because I'm interested in becoming a member of your society. And I was wondering if you could give me some more information. The name of the society is Leighton, so Leighton has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello, this is the Leighton Society. How can I help? Oh, hello. I'm just phoning you because I'm interested in becoming a member of your society and I was wondering if you could give me some more information. Of course. What would you like to know? Well, first of all, I'd like to know where you hold the club meetings. As I'm not very mobile anymore and I'm looking for somewhere that's within walking distance of my house. Are you still down at the old boathouse? No, we moved away from there a while ago. Meetings are now held at the clubhouse. Oh, brilliant. That's only five minutes from me. Do you require members to have any skills or experience? No, there is no experience required. We have plenty of female singers and actresses, but we don't have many men who can play the male roles. We are looking to resolve this, and are especially interested in recruiting male actors and singers. I've never sung professionally, but I'm very keen on it, and I've been told that I'm talented, so I think this would be a good fit. Do you organise coaches to transport members to practice at the theatre? Unfortunately, the club does not have sufficient funds to organise transportation, though this is something we are working towards. We are currently looking for members who can drive so that we can organise car sharing. Members who are able to shuttle people in their cars will obviously be compensated for their petrol usage. I don't drive, but I'd be happy to contribute some money in order to use the shuttle services. Yes, that is no problem. Are you aware of when the meetings take place? No, I couldn't find the meeting times on your website. We hold meetings from 6 to 8pm every Tuesday. Ah, that's lucky. I go to a debating club every Wednesday, so I'm glad that it's on a different night so I can attend both. Do you operate year-round? We used to close during December for the Christmas period, but we found that a lot of members wanted to continue their practices during this time. We operate for most of the year, but we do, however, close for August because the weather gets so hot that we are unable to practice comfortably. This may change when we have enough funds to operate the air conditioning. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. OK. I also wanted to ask how much the membership fee is and what is included with it. Our membership fee is inexpensive and it includes many benefits that certainly make the costs worth it. For example, we hold an annual event where members can meet each other and converse about topics that they have in common. We find that this is very popular, as the dinner is truly superb and included with your membership fee. Wow, that sounds great. 
and how much does membership cost? We have a couple of membership rates depending on your age and situation. For employed members under the age of 30, the fee is £40, while it costs £60 for members aged between 30 and 60. Which of these categories do you fit into? Oh, I don't fit into either of those. I'm 65 years old and retired, so I'm no longer employed. That's no problem at all. You qualify for the lowest price membership fee of £25, which applies to those who are either unemployed or retired. Wow, that's really affordable. I was thinking of bringing my grandson along to some of the practices, so what would the membership cost for him? He's 14. I'm afraid that the club is for adults only. That is to say we don't allow members who are aged 16 and under. He is welcome to join in two years' time, though. Ah, that's a shame. I guess I can wait and buy him a membership for his birthday present. Yes, what a good idea. I was hoping I could bring him with me so I have someone there to talk to. I'm worried that I won't have anything in common with the other members. I'm sure you'll fit in just fine. All our members are very friendly and interested in culture and music. Most of the people involved are modern authors looking for new experiences to write about in their books. You could read some of their books so you have something to discuss with them. That's a good suggestion. I'll definitely do that. I'm really looking forward to attending the annual dinner so I can meet new people and hopefully make some friends. Absolutely. Everyone has a great night and it's all for charity as all of the money raised from this event is donated to the children's hospital so they can buy toys and clothes. Wow, what a great cause. Well, I will definitely be popping in soon to arrange my membership. Thank you for all of your help. No problem at all. Goodbye. Bye. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Welcome to the Royal Pavilion, a magnificent palace and popular tourist attraction in Brighton. We are now in the entrance hall vestibule or octagon hall, a gorgeous room in peach blossom color. As you can see, it is octagonal shaped, and it was originally furnished with fret patterned chairs in Chinese style and a brass enclosed stove which provides a warm welcome to us all. Let us move on to the entrance hall. Unlike the octagon hall, this room is square shaped. You can see panels of serpents and dragons on a green pale wall and these pieces of wooden furniture resemble pollarded oak. We are now going to the Long Gallery and this corridor is named after the 16th century house galleries where paintings were displayed. It is furnished with bamboo pattern cabinets and oriental jars. We now move on to the banqueting room. As you can see, there is a long dining table and 36 satinwood chairs. It is set for the dessert course. In 1816-17, the menu was comprised of 60 dishes which had been carefully prepared by the French chef Marie-Antoine Carme to the Prince Regent and his guests. We shall now see where this extraordinary menu was prepared, this is the Great Kitchen. It was also known as the King's Kitchen. If you look at the ceiling, you can see four cast iron columns and copper tent-like awnings as they would remove excess smells and steam from the kitchen. The kitchen fire has a smoke jack, a device for turning five spits mechanically. You are now at the splendorous music room. There are nine lotus-shaped chandeliers hanging from the ceiling and they lit the room where the king's band performed Handel or Italian opera. Unfortunately, this room was damaged by the fire of 1975 and here is a photographic display of the pavilion's restoration. On the first floor, we shall see the king's and queen's apartments. These are the yellow bow rooms. These bedrooms belonged to King George IV's brothers, the Duke of York and the Duke of Clarence. It consists of a lobby, two bedrooms and servants' rooms. 
The furniture is made out of satinwood and mahogany. Queen Victoria's bedroom was furnished with a floral patterned Brussels carpet and fine silk bed linen and window curtains. The tassels were covered in silk and wool. There is also the maid's room and you can see a woolen mattress and the closet which was used as a water closet by the Queen or William IV. Section 3 You will hear three students discussing an experiment they're interested in. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Oh, hi Jen and Irene. Are you two heading to class? Hey Bill. Yes, we're just walking there now. We're a little bit early, but we wanted to prepare our apparatus for the experiment. Do you want to walk with us? Yes, sure. It'll be good to catch up. How is everything going with your experiment? Have you decided what your test subject is yet? It's going really well and we're conducting the test as laboratory partners. We've decided to test the effects of gravitational force on a series of objects with different densities. It's interesting, but it's a lot of work. I've been planning the experiment for the last two weeks and I only finished yesterday. Gosh, Irene, I'm really impressed by how hard-working you are. I enjoy chemistry so much that it doesn't feel like work. Whenever I have some free time at the weekend, I spend it in the laboratory working on it. It almost feels like a second home to me. How about you, Bill? Who is your laboratory partner? The tutor partnered me with Kim. At first I was worried because I've never worked with him before, and I was worried that he wouldn't be very good at laboratory work. But actually, he's very capable. I've noticed that he's always very well dressed. Yes, he's very stylish, and we share the same tastes in clothes. That doesn't stop him from getting his hands dirty, though. He's a very hard worker and makes a significant contribution, which I'm really grateful for. Ah, it's good that you get on well with your partner. It makes the experiment so much more enjoyable when you work well together. What do you think of the other people in our group? A lot of the boys are really good at maths, which is really helpful with all the calculations we have to do. Irene is good at maths as well, which makes her contribution really useful because she can do all the equations. I take care of all the writing because Irene finds that difficult. We'd probably fail without each other's help. That's true. I'm so glad that we're nearly finished. Only because you finished the data analysis. Oh, Jen, you give me too much credit. I'm so glad that I didn't get partnered with Linda again. Jen and I were grouped with her for our last experiment and it was a nightmare. Yes, she always submitted her work on time for the group work, but she never had her phone on her so it was impossible for anyone to keep in touch with her and vice versa. Her attitude was pretty annoying, but in all fairness she was a very hard worker because she realised the amount of work needed to get a high score. Jen is such a hard worker. In fact, she has been invited to work on the professor's personal project. Wow, that's amazing. Well done. Why were you picked? I thought he would pick one of the students that he's closer to. But he told me he was impressed with me because I always complete reading the assignments in time for class. I bet you'll be really popular among the other students when they find out. They'll all want to hear about the project. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30.
You should give everyone tasks so that they have the opportunity to participate. That's a really good idea, actually. Will you help me decide who to assign each task to? Of course. Now let's see. Well, as Irene finds writing difficult, perhaps it would be useful for her to practice that by doing the bibliography. I think the bibliography is a bit long for me. I think I'd be better suited to the methodology. Yes, that makes sense. Bill, you've told us that Kim is a hard worker, so I think he should be tasked with the conclusions, as there is quite a lot of effort involved. Okay, sure. I know that Kyle hasn't been feeling well, so he should take care of the abstract and the acknowledgement, because there is very little work to be done for those tasks. Jen, do you want to review some of the literature? It's a lot of work, but I know that you really enjoy writing, so I'm confident that you'll do a good job. Sure, sounds great. Right, so that leaves the bibliography and the discussion to assign. I think that Linda will struggle with the amount of work involved in the referencing, so perhaps I should take care of that task, and she can do the other one. That's great, guys. Thanks for your help. I'll tell the tutor when he arrives. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. In today's lecture, I'd like to look at post-operative pain and how we can manage it. Firstly, I'd like to introduce the types of pain patients experience after their surgery. The first one is cutaneous pain. Let us consider the surgical incision. Once the skin is incised, cutaneous nociceptors, or free nerve endings, are activated by the injury and release an acute, fast pain felt in the injury site. This is localized pain. The impulses are transmitted via afferent nerves to the central nervous system CNS and via peripheral nerves to the spinal cord. In the spinal cord, the impulses connect with type C fibers which, in turn, detect visceral pain. Since visceral nociceptors are in a range of organs, slow pain is felt in other parts of the body. This is why patients often complain about pain affecting different parts of their bodies. Moreover, pain synapses occur in the dorsal horn. As you can see, type A delta and type C fibers synapse with dendrites. This is due to the fact that the nerve extensions receive signals from other nerve cells. When this occurs, the pain travels up the spinal cord as neurons or nerve impulses until they reach the midbrain. The nerve impulses are then processed and transmitted to the body as a pain signal. Therefore, medication and painkillers should be administered according to the type and severity of pain. In other words, you should prescribe the appropriate medication for a patient who suffers from cutaneous pain and adequate analgesia for those who suffer from visceral pain. Right, let us look at the types of analgesia now. The first procedure is to determine the difference between pain threshold and pain tolerance. Pain threshold refers to the point which we all feel pain. Imagine the pain you feel when you spill boiling water on your hand. We agree that you receive a hand burn. This feeling is known as reaching the pain threshold. However, pain tolerance is described as the individual's sensitivity to pain. This is obviously very subjective as some people may be more susceptible to pain while others may have a low tolerance for pain. Nurses are instructed to hand out a questionnaire to the patient so that doctors can evaluate their pain tolerance. 
This questionnaire is known as the Pain Scales Universal Pain Assessment Tool, and it will guide you on the appropriate amount of analgesics. Okay, now let us consider the types of analgesics and their use in post-operative pain. Anti-inflammatory drugs, such as non-steroidal drugs, are often prescribed to patients suffering from localized pain. On the other hand, patients who feel aching pain should be treated with opioids. Opioids interrupt the transmission of nerve impulses in the dorsal horn so that they cannot cause pain any longer. Another interesting fact is that opioids have a chemical structure similar to endorphins, a natural painkiller produced by the human body. It is also important to note that pain management refers to a combination of pain-relieving drugs for pain control. In fact, paracetamol and opioids can be prescribed together. Paracetamol can be administered every four hours and the amount of opioids can be reduced by 30%. It provides patients with pain relief and leads to better outcomes. <laughs>